VPC stands for Virtual Private Cloud. As the name suggests, it helps you to define your own area for your own project. You may hear many funky terms and resources when VPC is in the discussion. Subnets, availability zones, access control lists, security groups, and other. We will dig deeper into all of them, but bear this in mind before doing that. You don't have to fully understand all these terms to really understand what VPC is. Once again, VPC is the concept to define the frame of your project. When you create some resources in AWS, like a server or a database, this resource has to be created inside a particular VPC. Now you are usually requested to define the VPC of it when you create your resource. Every AWS account comes up with a default VPC, but I almost never use it. To me, golden rule of thumb is to create a separate VPC for each project that I have. It doesn't cost you anything extra, and it helps big time to keep the resources organized and secure. So in case you are joining us recently, this video is actually part of series that we launched 2048 game in AWS environment. And as the first step, we will basically create a VPC today. And not only we will create it, but we will go through every single detail to understand why these details matter when creating VPC and how does it impact the project. And for simplicity, we will name the VPC 2048, but in your work, you can name it however you want. So without further ado, let's go ahead and create our first VPC. First thing first, log into your AWS account and type VPC in the search bar. What you see is your VPC dashboard. Click create VPC and resource to create. Up in here, select VPC and more. You can name your VPC anything you like, but for this time I will name it 2048. We don't really need 65,000 IP addresses for the project. For simplicity, I'll drop CIDR block to 20. Now you can see on the right side a little over 4,000 IP addresses that we have. It is more than enough. Also known is for IPv6. Default tenancy is good to go. It's good enough to remain in two availability zones. Two public and two private subnets are also good. We don't need any NAT gateway and we don't need any S3 gateway. Just make sure to enable DNS host names and resolution. Take a final look at the preview of your resources. If it looks similar to this one, click Create VPC. Will probably take less than a minute to create all resources and you can follow them. Once everything is ready, click View VPC and examine what you have created. Okay, we created our first VPC. We're almost there, one last step left and that is to create a security group. They are very essential and also very easy to create. Let's go ahead, create our security group and we go through every single detail to understand all the concepts. In your VPC dashboard, see the menu on the left side. From top of the menu, you can actually filter your resources to the 2048 VPC you just created. Once you do, find the security groups field at the bottom. Now this is the default security group created for your VPC. Let's not use it for a better practice. Let's create a new security group by clicking the button at the top right corner. We will provide SSH, HTTP and HTTPS access to the public. So you can name it similarly. Copy paste the name to the description, then very, very important, make sure you pick the right VPC. Most of the times AWS is placing default VPC here, but we want to create our security group in the new VPC we created. We will add rules only to inbound rules. Click add rule, select SSH as type. For source, select anywhere on IPv4. Then do exactly the same for selecting HTTP and HTTPS as the type. Once you have three of the inbound rules set, scroll down and click Create Security Group. Now we also generated our security groups. This is all we have to do today. If you already know what you have been doing and you understand the concepts, then you are good to go. But for someone new to AWS environment, these details can be overwhelming. So in the rest of the video, let's go through the steps that we have taken and understand everything in details. Now, when you are working on your AWS console, at top right, you are selecting your active region. For this tutorial, my region is Frankfurt. However, I can also pick any of the regions listed here. Then the VPC I want to have will be created in that particular region. There are many facilities owned by Amazon that are hosting your servers, databases and other details. But for their own reasons, they are separated as availability zones. Each region has two or three availability zones and it's possible to discover all of them in this map. So when you create resources in AWS or similar cloud vendors, often you will be hearing the term high availability. 
But what do people really mean with high availability? Let's take a database of your app for an example. And let's say the servers that are containing your database went down. That would also make your app not functioning and that would make issues for you. And in this situation, the replica or the backup of your database is actually saved in another availability zone. And whenever the server in one availability zone went down, the other one would go active immediately. So that would make your database highly available and your application active again in less than a second. It would minimize the risk. So this is the concept of being highly available and for data intensive, very commercial applications, this might be quite crucial and also handy. But for a simple game like 2048, we are fine if our app is down for a few minutes or even few hours. So normally even one availability zone would be enough for our concept. But just for this time, for the sake of for you to understand, I will make two availability zones in our project. Subnets, as defined in this preview, are representation of your VPC in each availability zone. If you want your VPC to remain at every availability zone of the region you selected, then choose here the maximum number on the left side. If you want to keep things simple and you are okay to have your VPC in one availability zone, select one here. Before deciding on the number of availability zones, we also declared our CIDR block for the VPC. Now this topic deserves a whole another video for explaining in details. But all you need to know for now is you decide here how many IP addresses you want to have on your VPC. You can change the IP number on the left side of your notation. Instead of 10, you can use 16 or 172 as used in common. This doesn't make much difference. Right side of the notation makes the difference. The bigger the number, the less IP address you will have available in your VPC. You can place any number between 0 to 32, though ideally a number between 16 to 20 will be good enough. It depends how complex your project is. Since our project is quite simple, we went on with 20 and received a little over 4000 private IP address range. IPv6 is another type of IP address definition that is a bit more complicated than regular IP addresses that you know. So far, they are used more frequently in telecommunications and Internet of Things projects. Unless your project is covering these fields, I suggest that you ignore IPv6 CIDR block and learn more about it next time you have some lunch break but you don't know what to watch while you are eating. Getting back to availability zones and subnets, a private subnet is not accessible from the Internet. It's only reachable to resources you create in your VPC. This can be the database of your web application or the authentication tool you have working in the backend. Public subnet, on the other hand, is a type of subnet that is accessible from the internet. Once again, it's possible to learn much more about uses of route tables and internet gateway, but what you should know for now, they are configured automatically that is allowing your subnet to become accessible on the internet. I think at this point it will be very useful to remind that a resource that you create, it can be an easy to instance or a database, just because it's in public subnet with an internet gateway, it doesn't necessarily mean that it will have internet access, it will be available to the public. Since security is an extremely important detail in the cloud, you actually need to provide additional permissions for public to have access to your resources. And these additional permissions are basically security groups. Following the creation of VPC, we immediately generated a security group. Security groups have inbound and outbound rules. As the name suggests, inbound rules define from which protocols and which IP addresses your resource can accept a request. Compare this to a message you receive, basically allowing who can send you a message and from which protocol. Outbound rules, on the other hand, are to who you can send message and from which protocol. For most of practices, outbound rules are allowed for the entire traffic to everywhere. Probably the first 10-20 projects you will complete, your focus will be entirely on inbound rules. It's really great if you learn more about each type, starting with SSH, HTTP, HTTPS, MySQL Aurora, TCP and UDP. Also realize that choosing a type is just automatically deciding over the protocol and the port range. Another important part in the destination, you can limit the permission on this protocol to any IP address. In other words, to everyone, or you can specify it to your own IP address. To give you a little more practical example, let's say you have your personal website on AWS, 
and you want people from all around the world to access to your website, to view your pictures, your posts and stuff like that. For this to be available, you will create inbound rules on HTTP and HTTPS and you will make it accessible to everyone. But on the other hand, sometimes you will need to SSH into your EC2 instance and you have to update your packages, you have to administer it. And for this one, SSH is the protocol that you want to activate. But this doesn't have to be accessible by everyone and that's why you can limit it only to your personal IP address. It's also quite a common trick to see inbound rules referring to security groups instead of IP addresses. This creates an internal communication that any resource this security group is attached, these resources can exchange things between each other. There is surely much more you can learn about VPCs, subnets, security groups and network in general. But for today, we actually made quite some good process and I believe we are on a good track. And if you want to make it more practical, feel free to go to VPC dashboard, try a little bit, create another one, delete and so on and so forth. And you will see the resources that we created today will be useful in the rest of our project. So if you have any suggestions or if you have any questions that you want to ask, feel free to share in the comments below. I will be happy to answer them and I want to make sure that you are eager to learn much more about VPCs and follow the rest of our 2048 journey. Thank you very much for your interest so far and I see you on the next one.